So when we talk about the central nervous system, we're talking about the integration, processing, and prioritizing area of the nervous system. Remember, information comes in, it's processed, and the appropriate response goes out. Now, the central nervous system is protected by the scalp, skin, skull, vertebral column, meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood-brain barrier. Now, the meninges are basically dense connective tissue. We have an area that becomes one with the periosteum, which is really important. That's up here. We have another layer that clings directly to the surface. And then we have this middle area that basically helps to house and control the vessels coming through and how they stay. It's through the arachnoid layer that we see the exchange of materials between the fluid in the cerebral spinal fluid and the venous system. The other thing is to recognize that the meningeal layer helps to anchor the brain within the skull. So I have this soft tissue connected to this dense connective tissue that then connects to the skull that helps to hold it in place. Now, the cerebral spinal fluid is really important in terms of brain health, and it's because it's just different enough from blood. It has a unique composition, both in terms of ions, glucose, etc. It's formed within the choroid plexus, which is right here near the fourth ventricle. And it's basically both protection in terms of chemical makeup and protection because it's this watery fluid sac that surrounds the brain. So it helps to protect it against impact with the skull. Now, the cerebral spinal fluid is circulated. So we have ependymal cells within the, that surround this area that help to have cilia that help to literally move the cerebral spinal fluid throughout. And it also moves within these ventricles or these gaps within the brain and within the center of the spinal cord. And then it also surrounds the brain. And this is really important to maintaining the health of the brain. In addition to protection in terms of cushioning, it helps to control that chemical makeup, which we've already talked about. Now, there are ways to disrupt the function. And one of the primary ways is in terms of environment. So if I affect the chemical makeup in such a way that I change the pH, I change the ionic composition, or I change body temperature, I impact how the brain functions. This we already know is hyperthermia, so remember if you maintain a fever for too long, the proteins denature. We can also see an impact in terms of what the brain does, it uses tons of ATP. So if I don't get adequate oxygen, ATP production is done and the brain no longer functions. Now, the brain itself is broken into four parts. We have the cerebrum, which is out here. We have the diencephalon, we have the brainstem, and we have the cerebellum. So to start with, this is the cerebrum. The cerebrum is what we think of when we typically think of the brain. It's what we see, it's the outermost portion, it's the newest in terms of evolution, and it's where we, it's what, the cerebrum is what makes us human. The cerebrum is what gives us our higher ordered thinking skills. Now, the cerebrum is, divided into various parts. So we have a right and left half. We have um, ridges and grooves, and the ridges and grooves are what give us what we think of as the higher order brain thinking skills. And you'll notice a dramatic difference between human brains and the sheep brain in that notion. Now, the presence of those, the sulci and the gyri, also lead to more deeper grooves, these what they call fissures. And that goes along the lines associated with the occipital, parietal, and frontal areas, which correspond to the skull bones surrounding it. And so we see different functions also that play a role there. So we have certain areas that are primarily associated with the temporal lobe. We have certain functions primarily associated with the occipital lobe, etc. Now, quick reminder, gray matter is going to be our nuclei. White matter is going to be the myelin. So we're talking oligodendrocytes when we deal with the central nervous system. The cerebrum also has specialized areas in terms of function. So as we said, by lobes, but then also within those lobes, we see this division of labor. And it's very much a division according to sensory and motor. So sensory input and motor output. We also have what we call association areas, where we see the integrative processes that we associate with um, kind of figuring out what's going on and what the appropriate response is. Now, the homunculus is a way to find, it's, a, what it is, is it, how do you phrase this? It's basically a non-normal body, but 
created based on the amount of brain tissue associated with that function. So you can see when we did the skin sensitivity, your arm and your elbow were not very sensitive, but your hands were, and you can see why, because a lot more of the brain goes to the hands than it does to the arm and the hand and the uh, elbow. Now the diencephalon was the central area of the brain. Okay, it's this area here. It's the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the epithalamus. And these play various roles. As a whole, we're looking at coordination of activity here, and by that I mean coordination along the lines of our thalamus. In other words, it's the relay station. From here, information is processed and sent to the appropriate part of the cerebral cortex for it to be processed and determine the correct response. The hypothalamus also plays a role. It's significant in terms of how it works with the other control system of the body, the endocrine system. And we see this with both its physical proximity to the pituitary gland and its neural and cardiovascular connection to the pituitary gland. Because within the hypothalamus is where we see fight or flight, which we will spend a lot of time on when we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, so a component of the peripheral nervous system. Now, the third one is the brainstem. The brainstem is, in essence, think of it as the survival. If anything goes wrong with the brainstem, the entire body will die. Because notice what's going on. We have mostly fiber tracks. We have control of breathing. We see vision and hearing in these areas. We have uh, heart rate, blood pressure, swallowing, etc. And the other thing that makes it so important is because this is obviously where the spinal cord comes into the rest of the brain. So we have this basic area, and it's this area that can get severely damaged if we do anything with the atlas or axis. So if you have any damage to C1C2, you're looking at infecting this general area right in here. Now the reticular formation is really important because it's basically what allows us to wake or sleep. In other words, the reticular formation is what determines whether we have awareness and you to be to perceive anything to be to know it's hot cold requires awareness and the reticular formation is responsible for that and you can kind of see we have auditory information come in we have visual information come in it affects this entire area which then transmits the information to the cerebrum which is where we get our awareness from now the cerebellum is known as the mini brain um, it does something through comparator activities in other words if you've ever tried to throw a ball when you were five versus now, ideally there's a difference in how you throw. In other words, your cerebellum compares motor movements. It has an ideal of what it should look like and then it has the actual, so it gets feedback from it. So if you literally pause the video, you close your eyes, you put your arms way out, and then you try to bring your finger, your index finger to your nose, usually the first time you might miss. The second time you're closer, and the third time you usually hit directly on your nose. Your cerebellum is what allows you to determine and make adjustments so that you do it right, ultimately. Now, different things can go wrong with the brain. The first thing is what we call traumatic brain injuries. This is concussions, contusions, and cerebral edema. Edema meaning swelling. Now, since I have a hard exterior, the skull, and if the brain moves quickly and bounces against the skull, we can get a concussion or a contusion. The main thing to recognize is it's not exactly that nervous tissue doesn't regenerate. It just doesn't seem to regenerate very fast. And quite frankly, we really do have stem cells in our brains, but controlling and determining where they go and how they work and how we can ultimately rebuild something that is destroyed, we don't know. And so a lot of these things, concussions, contusions, and edema tend to result in permanent brain damage. Now, again, the swelling, this edema kind of makes sense because if I have something hard and I have something soft and I have this increase in fluid here, yeah, the soft tissue is going to give and move in and that's going to cause damage to it. Now, the other one is cerebral vascular accident, otherwise known as stroke. And there's two ways we produce a stroke. Both involve blood supply. So I either have a break in the blood, an aneurysm, a hemorrhage, or I have a blockage. And either way, going back to how I disrupt brain function, if I don't have any oxygen, I can't, have, I can't produce ATP, brain function stops. The last one we'll talk about in terms of brain injury is Alzheimer's. And you can see the dramatic difference between the two sides, on the Alzheimer's side and this side, both in terms of the amount of folding 
and the literal amount of tissue. And so the loss of tissue kind of explains why you see such dramatic personality changes in people with Alzheimer's. Okay, finally the spinal cord, our second part of the central nervous system. Notice the spinal cord is what is housed within our vertebrae. We have different enlargements, and those are associated with, um, we have what's known as the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, we have a lumbar plexus. And so these are just little areas of enlargement where we see different neurons come out for the um, nerves. Now, a couple of things with the nerves is they're simply bundled axons. And just like with the uh, brain, we see meninges completely covering it. So we have everything from the dura mater to the arachnoid mater to the pia mater. We also have a blood-brain barrier occurring here. So these are covered by astrocytes as well because that cerebral spinal fluid is what's moving over and around. So the spinal cord is no different from the brain in terms of the environment required for proper functioning. Now, one of the other th cool things here is what's known as the cauda equina. And this is literally why we have um, spinal taps done in this area is the spinal cord isn't solid. It actually breaks apart into, you could think of it like fingers, and so it's easier to slip a needle in between those and do what needs done. Um, the white matter and gray matter is the same. We have the presence of myelin versus uh, cell neurons. The other thing that's interesting is within the spinal cord, we do see dorsal root and ventral root functional differences, just like what we observed with the areas of the cerebrum having specialized functions. And this goes back to that idea of motor input and sensory, I mean sensory input and motor output. Because all of the information has to travel through the spinal cord, we have dedicated areas within the spinal cord for that purpose. And that's what we see with the dorsal root and ventral roots.